title of this next talk kind of freaked me out. Um, space time from quantum mechanics. Uh, and I'll introduce Dr. Lampros Lamprou. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure and a challenge to give this talk. So uh, for the next 21 minutes, I will talk to you about space time and quantum mechanics. And in fact, how to get space time from quantum mechanics. So during the 20th century, theoretical physicists uh, set the, the pillars of our understanding of the universe as we know it so far. This is the general theory of relativity and the theory of quantum mechanics. General relativity describes the phenomenon of gravitation uh, and it is experimentally, observationally verified in numerous ways. They pred it correctly predicts the motion of planets, it predicts gravitational waves. Uh, and the theory of quantum mechanics, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, was built in order to explain the behavior of atoms and subatomic particles. Now, at first glance, these two theories live at very vastly different scales. They describe different aspects of the world, but there are specific situations where both of them become relevant. The situations in, in, uh, include uh, the cosmology of the early universe uh, and certain aspects of the physics of black holes. So during the 20th century, another thing that we managed to do as theoretical physicists was to perfect the method of quantization, a machine that takes a classical theory like general relativity, for example, puts it through a specific well understood process and gets a quantum theory out of this. This is how most of our experimentally uh, uh, relevant quantum theories have been produced. But when people try to do that for gravity, they ran into inconsistencies. These were not subtle mathematical problems that we didn't have the tools to solve. These were paradoxes, contradictions that could be traced back to the fundamental principles of the two theories. Now, for a theoretical physicist, this is an ideal situation. This is a, the theoretical analog of data. Whenever theories that you trust uh, lead to paradoxes, Usually, historically, they, uh, they are signs of a, the existence of a new fundamentally different framework that underlies them, a new set of principles, a new set of concepts. A famous example is how Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism was predicting that uh, atoms are unstable. The resolution to this paradox was not a, a slight modification of Maxwell's equations. It was a completely new perspective on physics. It was quantum mechanics. So similarly, we hope that uh, by trying to reconcile the principles of these two theories, uh, one will re it, what this process will reveal will be a new framework. A framework which has been traditionally called the, the program of quantization of gravity. However, I will advocate that perhaps a better way of thinking of this way of reconciling the two, print the two theories uh, is instead the geometrization of quantum mechanics. Now, this is more than a wordplay. It is a new perspective on the subject whose key idea is that space-time, uh, Einstein's invention with its geometry and, the, uh, and its dynamics described by Einstein's equations by, by general, the general theory of relativity, are emergent concepts. Zen explained the principle of emergence. So a simple analogy to have in mind of what emergent means is uh, for example, take a liquid. Uh, we do know that fundamentally the liquid is composed by atoms and molecules, each of, each of them described by well understood laws. But when we uh, try to describe the behavior of the liquid at macroscopic scales, we can treat it as a continuum fluid obeying the laws of hydrodynamics. The laws of hydrodynamics don't apply to molecules or atoms. So they're effective notions, they're emergent concepts. Similarly, the, the picture I want to advocate here today is that space-time should be thought of as a similar type of thing, an approximate description of an underlying quantum mechanical theory. And what is space-time made of? Well, the slogan to have in mind that I will try to make sense of it is that space-time is built out of quantum mechanical correlations. It is a geometric representation of the way quantum degrees of freedom are correlated via the phenomenon of entanglement. 
Now, this sounds both radical and obscure, and the point of the next uh, 15 minutes is to explain what I mean by this. So let's start, is there any sort of understanding of how this emergent space picture can be made precise? So theoretical physicists like toy models, and here's the toy model of emergent space that we have at hand. It's called ABS-CFT duality. In one line, it's an equivalence between a gravity theory and a quantum mechanical theory. What does this word duality mean? Well, here's an impressionistic example of what duality means. We all agree that we're looking at a single picture, but there are two ways of organizing the information you see in this picture. One way of organizing it will reveal a big face of an old lady looking that way, and the other way will reveal the face of a young lady looking away from us. You have two different ways of interpreting the same, a single physical content. If you don't see it, it will take a little bit more time, so I won't see. <laughs> You can find it on Google. So the point is that there's a similar situation happening in this ADS-CFT duality, although a mathematical version of that. You have two seemingly very distinct theories, mathematical theories, which have identical physical content. One of these theories is a theory of gravity, which works uh, uh, more or less like, uh, actually exactly like uh, gravity in our universe. Uh, it obeys Einstein's equations, but it, it's, a th it's a gravity theory that describes a universe uh, which differs from ours in cosmological scales. So instead of uh, a gravity in this expanding universe that we seem to inhabit with a positive cosmological constant, this is gravity in a universe with a negative cosmological constant. The effect of this uh, negative curvature of the space is to essentially trap everything inside this universe. So a three-dimensional anti-de-sitter universe, that's how this universe is called, uh, you can think of it as, a, as an infinite cylindrical box, a universe in a can. And if a particle tries to escape, it will necessarily come back uh, due to this negative curvature of space. But other than that, at smaller scales, uh, stars can exist, solar systems can exist, everything works the same as in our universe, and is in fact a quantum theory of gravity. And the statement of this ADS-CFT duality is that this gravitational theory is exactly equivalent to an ordinary quantum theory with no gravity, and importantly, living in one dimension lower. This means that these two different descriptions of the same physics don't even live in the same number of dimensions. The quantum theory, for example, for this three-dimensional universe is a two-dimensional quantum theory, which you can imagine as living on the boundary of this can. This is an equivalence proposed 20 years ago. It has stood the test of time. We have tested it in, any way that, in every way that was possible. And it's an example of this idea of an emergent space. Because if I focus on the right-hand side, the quantum theory, the geometry of this gravitational, of this other uh, picture, the gravitational theory, is somewhere hidden in the structure of this complicated theory. So, and that is the question that has been troubling me for years and continues to trouble me, which is how is the space-time geometry of this other gravitational picture encoded in the structure of the quantum theory? Where can you find space? How can you measure distances? How can you measure the curvature of space? So, and it is in this toy model that this idea, that this profound connection, profound, at least we think it is profound, uh, between the geometry of space and quantum correlations first came up. So, quantum systems have various peculiar things. Here's one of them. If I give you a classical system composed by two components, let's call them A and B, I can describe the state of the composite system by giving the state of A and the state of B. Then you know the state of AB. In quantum systems, however, if I give you the state of A and the state of B, you don't necessarily know the state of A and B. That is because quantum systems can store information about their states in the correlation between the components. This is the property of entanglement of quantum systems, and uh, Itamar will talk more about this. The point is, uh, this becomes relevant in our, in our context because we can go on this quantum theory that lives on the boundary of this can, and then take, take a subsystem. The, one, uh, the degrees of freedom uh, that are exactly inside this uh, red interval that I drew. This system has a state, so let's call it rho, uh, and the complement, everything else, has another state. And you may ask the question, how much information 
is hidden in the correlations of this system with the rest. There's a measure for that. We call it entanglement entropy or a quantum entropy. It can be computed mathematically via this formula, which is completely relevant for our purposes. The point is that there is a measure of how much a subsystem of a quantum mechanical theory is correlated with everything else. And the connection that's relevant for our purposes is that this quantity in the dual picture measures the length of a geodesic that connects the endpoints of that interval. It measures the length of the geodesic in Planck units. This is the famous Ryuta Kayanagi formula. And we believe it's a deep realization. We believe it's a hint that goes at the heart of what the quantum theory of gravity uh, is doing. We have a purely quantum uh, uh, information theoretic quantity, something that measures quantum correlations directly related to a purely geometric quantity, the length of the curve. We don't fully understand the implications of this, and my work and many people's work has been focusing on trying to recover other properties of space-time using the structure of quantum correlations. This is a hint, not the answer. So one thing that, for example, I have been particularly interesting in, interested in trying to, uh, to explain is uh, how can you measure the curvature of space? After all, uh, the curvature of space-time is precisely uh, what, uh, what is responsible for the phenomenon of gravitation according to Einstein's theory. So how can we recover the curvature, how can we measure the curvature of space? So for that, it's good to go back and think of how, what, what does it mean to measure curvature in general? We have a simple example of a curved space, the Earth, it's a sphere. If we live on the Earth, then we, exp we essentially move around a curved space. How can you measure the curvature of the Earth? There's a nice operational way of doing so, which exploits an idea that's 200 years old, the Foucault pendulum. Take a pendulum and set it in motion and allow it to oscillate along a specific axis, which I denote by V0. As the Earth rotates, the, this pendulum is being parallel transported on a circle around the sphere. And by the time we come back to the same point after 24 hours, the, you observe that the axis of this oscillation has precessed by a specific angle. This is an example of a geometric phase. And the reason for this precession, for this frame precession, is the curvature of space. It's a general fact about curved spaces. So one way of probing or measuring the curvature of space-time as well would be to try to understand what this uh, pre frame precessions, how to understand this frame precession in the context of the ADS CF, uh, in, in the context of ADS CFT. So now we want to probe the curvature of space time. We will draw some two word lines, let's say two observers that meet at some point, travel their separate paths and meet again. At first they agree on the direction of the vector. Each of them takes this vector with them, they parallel transport it, and then they meet again and they compare the direction of their vectors. What they find gener generally in a curved space is that the two vectors are related by a relative Lorentz transformation, which is the analog of the rotation we had before. So what we did in, a, in our very recent work, it's currently actually uh, being written, is to understand what this, how to describe this in quantum mechanics. Uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated by the picture is the following. Consider these Ryuta Kaganagi geodesics that I was talking about before, and imagine all the geodesics that intersect this loop at every point orthogonally. So essentially this loop composed by these two world lines defines for you a family, a dense family of geodesics, each of which corresponds to a subsystem on the boundary. The point is that all these subsystems are correlated, and what my collaborators and I discovered was that there is a quantum mechanical version of a curvature for the same state for the for this family of subsystems. For those of you more familiar with quantum mechanics, this is a version of, a, of the Berry curvature. And the point is that the Berry curvature of the of the subsystem of the space of subsystems is related, is responsible for this frame transformation in this under the Cedar picture. This became a little bit more sophisticated. The moral of, uh, of the story is that there are uh, increasingly more sophisticated ways of understanding how subsystems of this quantum mechanical system are correlated with each other and how they translate to very ordinary and very 
uh, well understood properties of space time. So to leave you with uh, a conceptual framework which I believe underlies this, uh, this whole connection between space time and entanglement, I will say the following. Space time was introduced as a way of organizing the relations between reference frames. That's why space time was introduced. A less appreciated fact is that when we talk about quantum mechanical reference frames, it is entanglement that aligns them. It is entanglement that determines the relations between them. And it is in this sense, I think this is at the heart of this, the statement that space-time is a representation of quantum correlations. Space-time is a representation of the alignment of frames which is fundamentally uh, provided by the property of quantum correlations. So I'll stop here. I'll just have to thank uh, my collaborators because I wouldn't have done this work by myself. My longtime collaborator, Bartek Czech, as well as Lenny Saskind, with whom I'm writing a paper as we speak. Uh, Yan de Boer and Dong Seng Ge uh, are also collaborators I'm working with uh, in uh, a related project. And James Sally and Sam McCandless are older collaborators uh, who taught me a lot about physics and all the ideas that uh, I emerged over the past few months has been uh, the end product of a five-year collaboration with those guys. So I want to thank them all, as well as many other people who have helped me, say, who have helped me shape my ideas. And um, also, Neil and Jane, this is a great opportunity to be here and giving you this talk uh, and enjoying the benefits of this program. Uh, the peace of mind, the freedom that the Papalardo program provides is crucial uh, for all of us. And we thank you very much for this. In your work on quantum mechanics, is there any hint of three dimensional, three dimensions of space? So uh, every quantum mechanical theory, uh, these, are uh, these are quantum field theories that uh, I was referring to, uh, live in some number of dimensions. Uh, this, uh, in this context, you can imagine the quantum theory to be in two dimensions, in this simple example that I was right. describing, or it could be in higher dimensions, in three or in four, or in any dimensions that you want. The, however, it, what all these results seem to point towards is that uh, there are certain quantum mechanical theories that even though you think that they live, let's say, in two dimensions or in three dimensions, Secretly, they can be equivalently re-translated into a theory of gravity in one dimension higher. Which is, sounds like completely crazy, but it's also completely true. So it is, a, so it is the fact, it's precisely the statement of duality. It's the fact that you may have two different, vastly different descriptions of uh, mathematical theories, I'm sorry, which however describe exactly the physical context. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an idea that has been observed uh, in various uh, different corners of physics, but it's becoming more and more relevant in these discussions of understanding quantum gravity. So the statement is that yes, quantum mechanical theories, you can imagine them in any number of dimensions, but certain of them can actually are secretly gravity theories in one dimension higher, which is what this whole perspective is about. Thank you. I, I'm gonna ask, I think it's a very naive question. Uh, every talk I've ever heard before on, on the issues between quantum mechanics and gravity has assumed that quantum mechanics is fine and there's something wrong with gravity. Um, in fact, the fact that you call it a, a quantum theory of gravity instead of a gravitational theory of quantum mechanics. Are you saying actually both may be exactly right and it's just we don't understand how they, they you know, reflect on each other or I am saying am that I the two are actually much more intimately related than we thought before. The lesson of uh, the past, uh, I would say 20, but more appropriately 10 years, is that the two theories, the theory of gravity and the theory of quantum mechanics, look more and more like the same thing. Uh, it's just a different interpretations of the same object. And that's, that's the picture that, so it is true that uh, there are good reasons why you should think that quantum mechanics is more fundamental. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are certain things about gravity uh, that uh, you would say are, uh, uh, is, yeah, in the, in the combination of gravity and quantum mechanics, it's, gravity is the bad guy. 
Uh, right. So they have reasons to want to keep quantum mechanics. Now, of course, I can't foresee the future. I don't know what's going to happen to quantum mechanics ultimately. But so far, it seems that uh, uh, these two actually are more or less the same thing. And we just need to understand how to translate one to the other. Okay. Yes? Hey, maybe you can help me out. I'm trying to figure out really what, you're, what you have, this idea you have. Uh, of, you, let me take and expand your example of the Foucault pendulum, okay? I'd like you to explain to me at a level where quantum mechanics would come in and you say what part of that orbit, that's the Foucault pendulum, involves, quote, entanglement. And is it the prior knowledge that the system has that it's sitting on the Earth? Or what, what, what is, where is the entanglement in that, oh, in that picture? Okay. Good. So yeah. there, are, there are two pictures. So maybe that's the confusing part. There are two pictures. In one picture, all I'm doing is I'm taking a vector and I'm just parallel transporting it in a curved space time. And this is a well understood classical process. We all know how to do this. You write down the equations and you find this frame precession and you compute it. And now you ask, well, this universe with this curvature, according to this ADS-CFT duality, is equivalent, equivalently described by this quantum mechanical theory with no curvature. So how do I understand this precession? What is responsible for this precession right. of the vector? And the statement is that, I didn't explain the details because I would need an, an hour uh, to go through the technical part of it, but the idea is that there exists a curvature associated with the states of subsystems of the quantum mechanical theory. And this curvature is uh, essentially a probe of how these subsystems are correlated in the global state. Uh, and, uh, and the point is that this curvature is essentially the quantum analog, the dual interpretation of what this ordinary precession of the frame in, a, in an Sitter space computes. But it's through the Hamiltonian. I mean, it's, you know, you, you still have to write a Hamiltonian for that. Uh, well, I mean, okay, so yes, dynamics is definitely part of the story. Uh, you could imagine that the loop is also on, let's say, a, a given space like slice. It didn't have to be... So the, the point I'm trying to make is that the way subsystems are correlated in the wave function, of course, the Hamiltonian helps you write down the wave function and evolve it in time. But the key, I'm try the key idea I'm trying to convey is that the, uh, it is the correlations between subsystems that are responsible for this precession. Of course, you're going to have to write down the wave function of the theory and evolve it in time in order to actually compute these things that I'm saying. Uh, but... Uh, well, we can discuss more in detail if you're interested. Let's, but, let's yeah. talk after. I, I, I'd like to I'll pursue that I'll be happy to explain more, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, there were a few things you were saying that I felt like I was just starting to understand. And then, okay, so in maybe one of your last slides, there was something... Um, that you were saying, yeah, about the reference frames. Ah, um, in the last one, I think? Right, exactly. Um, yeah, actually, well, okay, so maybe can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, Ooh. What are the reference frames? <laughs> <laughs> so, in okay, here's a slogan. Here's a slogan way of, exp of expanding on this. In quantum mechanics, so how do you treat reference frames in quantum mechanics? Well, you assign wave functions to them. And how, how are you going to put them in a global picture? You will write the wave function that includes all reference frames as individual wave functions. Now, in quantum mechanics, if you say measurements are indefinite, this means that you get a, an ensemble of possible results. And in general, the relations between the measurement that one observer will perform and the relation of, to, to the measurement that some other observer will perform will also be indefinite. Now, the point is that what, how can you make these, how can you establish definite relations between these two observers? Entanglement is the key. The, the, whether two observers will have some sort of re relation between their, what their observed values of something is very sensitively dependent uh, on the way they're correlating the global wave function. So that's the point, that entanglement essentially helps you align quantum reference frames. Again, I would like to discuss this in detail, but I think anything more than that, it will be too, too technical. And you were saying that you had a result um, 
that uh, quantum berry phases are related to some uh, reference frame transform in the gravity theory? That's right, yes. That's uh, the, the key is that there is a notion, there is a curvature that you need, that, I'm sorry. There is a curvature you can assign to the subsystems of this quantum theory, and there is an associated Berry phase which is induced by that curvature, and you can relate this to precisely this frame precession of these vectors in the ADS picture. All right, let's thank Lampros again. Thanks. Our next talk continues the, the theme of quantum mechanical entanglement and is Dr. Itmar Kimchi, Dirty Quantum Entanglement. So I, I will stop you if there's anything inappropriate. <laughs> Too quantum. <laughs> how, how quantum can I get? As, as quantum as you want. It's the dirty part I was. <laughs> Good, very good. So uh, I'll tell you today uh, about work uh, I've done here at MIT for the past um, almost three years, being the Florida Fellow. Um, I hope it's a catching uh, title to get your attention. So uh, let me start with quantum entanglement, uh, where, which we heard about a little bit in the talks earlier. Uh, and if, you know, I'm familiar with quantum entanglement originally as this uh, idea uh, from um, uh, the early discussions of quantum mechanics, uh, for example, by Einstein and others, uh, with thought experiments. And in the thought experiments, they imagined taking two photons and entangling them, making them into some entangled state, so that measuring one directly, immediately, uh, also impacts the state of the other. Uh, and then you can shine the light of the two photons in different directions, so now you have separated, entangled objects. Uh, and that's what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Uh, and of course, back then it was a thought experiment, and now uh, in many labs, including of course here at MIT, uh, people do that with lasers in the lab, uh, which I find amazing, right? So there is this control of entangled objects that people achieve, and you can, you can uh, understand this entanglement as a feature of quantum physics. And as a quantum condensed matter theorist, what I'm interested in is not just these two photons, but all the 10 to the 23rd number of electrons in a material, right? So in a material, in a chunk of rock sitting on the ground, we also have quantum objects inside this chunk of material, which is electrons. All of chemistry is electrons, which are quantum objects. Uh, and so they can get entangled and do get entangled. Uh, and to understand them, of course, it's not just the entanglement between two objects. We have to understand this collective behavior, entanglement and interaction of these many particles, 10 to the 23rd particles. Uh, and th that gets to be a little bit of a tricky problem, for me at least. And of course it gets even trickier when you consider that the real material isn't even just this uh, kind of often thought of theoretical idea of just many particles interacting together. In a given material, there is a crystal lattice. It has imperfections and randomness, impurities, or sometimes built-in randomness. So there's always some kind of disorder or randomness going on as well. Uh, yeah, it's not just um, 
it's not just the many particles. Uh, there is this other stuff that usually gets thrown out in theoretical treatments because it's too difficult, this randomness of this, or dirt, what people call sometimes. Um, good, so that's the setting. Uh, 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 and entanglement is the important feature of quantum mechanics. And we also know that quantum mechanics can give you weird things. Just experimentally, we know that if you take some materials, uh, like, for example, uh, these particular magnets that are in this phase diagram, and you take some electrons out of these insulating magnets, that's this axis uh, hole concentration, meaning experimentalists take some electrons out of the magnet, and what you get is some superconductor, which is a high temperature superconductor. So there, there's weird stuff that goes on in materials. Because of the electrons, and it's clear, for example, in this case that people have been studying for decades that uh, it really involves the quantum mechanics and interaction of the electrons in weird ways that we don't yet totally understand even. Um, that you get from just removing some electrons from the insulating magnet. So that motivates, you know, these kinds of, and there's many different kinds of these experimental mysteries, motivate us to try to understand this collective behavior of uh, quantum objects like electrons. And uh, as one framework for the motivation I want to talk about today is uh, how do you get long-range quantum entanglement in a solid, right? Because usually when we think of quantum effects, it's a short-range thing. Quantum mechanics is a short-range thing. Okay, we can entangle two photons here and then shine them in opposite directions, and there's this entanglement. But usually quantum mechanics effects happen at short length scales. Uh, how do you get entanglement to arise between electrons that are sitting across from each other across the chunk of rock that you picked up in your hand. How do you get that kind of long-range entanglement? And to describe that, uh, what uh, the previous talks, including uh, Gen B, alluded to, um, these kinds of phases of matter would go beyond the standard Landau paradigm of distinguishing phases of matter or behaviors of electrons based on just symmetry. So we have the usual symmetry consideration distinguishing ice and water. Uh, but this would go beyond that. So it's beyond magnetization, even beyond superconductivity. This kind of framework requires even a, just a framework, a paradigm, uh, that goes beyond these descriptions, which are all kind of symmetry-based descriptions, when you have, if you have this kind of uh, uh, entanglement as a key feature. Uh, and another uh, uh, way to motivate this, you know, so, th so there's lots of reasons to try to find paradigms that go beyond this traditional Landau symmetry paradigm. Uh, and another reason, if we could find such a paradigm, that would help us tackle this kind of pesky but always uh, present ingredient of randomness or dirt in samples. Because, of course, the moment that you have randomness or dirt, you no longer have uh, beautiful symmetric crystal. You lose some of the symmetry. So the moment you have randomness, um, you, know, you suggest that to capture everything about the randomness, you need to go beyond this uh, Landau symmetry paradigm. Good. So that's what I'll try to talk about. So to do that, uh, and in this theoretical work that we've been doing for the past few years, we were able to take, I think, a significant step in this direction. Um, in something I'm, I'm really proud of, actually. Uh, and to do that, we needed to uh, have some brand new ideas. So we needed to combine ideas from totally different uh, sub-disciplines uh, within physics. So that in includes uh, the collection of a uh, discipline of quantum magnetism. Spin one half means electron spin. So people have studied uh, the magnetism of electrons in materials uh, and the material science connected to that as well as more theory. That's one subfield. There's a subfield that studies quantum information and very abstract and algorithmic uh, computer science even related aspects of entanglement in quantum information. And of course there is, forget quantum mechanics, classical statistical physics. Uh, that's its own uh, subfield that, uh, uh, that's very rich. And we actually needed to combine knowledge and results and ideas from all these different fields to make progress here. So we did that. Uh, and uh, another aspect in which uh, the particular things we took uh, that I'll discuss more later, uh, we needed to understand the concept of frustration, which roughly speaking means what happens when you have energetically competing states that are almost at the same energy and you don't know which one to choose, just minimizing energy doesn't tell you which state to take. The notions of quantum entanglement from quantum information uh, and uh, a lot of results on what happens with randomness from classical physics. And we needed to combine all of these. 
to get this new approach uh, that we've developed here. Um, okay, so that's the approach. So let me remind you, uh, I, I'm sure you remember, uh, but just in case, I'll remind you a little bit from two years ago, from uh, uh, what I talked about in this room, about some of my uh, doctoral research with Ashwin Vishwanath. Um, then I talked about frustrated quantum magnets uh, and how do you get entanglement in these settings. Uh, and one way to view what I'll talk about today is taking that and adding this new ingredient of randomness or disorder or dirt. Uh, an important new ingredient that's always present that gives you immense theoretical complications. It makes everything messy. You lose the symmetry. Uh, but we can address it. We find some predictions of what you should see in experiments that actually surprisingly are independent of details, even though you have randomness, we find some universality that we expect. We talk to experimentalists and find that a bunch of experimental data, old data and new data, our theory can explain, actually in really simple ways. Uh, and the theory implies and involves long-range entanglement. And I'll try to discuss all of this now uh, for the rest of my talk uh, uh, with pictures. Uh, so that everything really makes sense. So everything should hopefully make sense. And I don't know if it's okay, but I, I would also welcome questions during the talk as well as after. Uh, uh, if you'd like uh, to stop me as well to make sure that things make, because I'm trying to do a lot of things here actually in this talk. Good. So to start with, <laughs> very good. Okay, so to start with, let me, let me just introduce again the concept of frustration from another angle, a familiar angle, which is glasses. Glasses like uh, some of us uh, might have on our face, uh, or uh, the window glass hidden behind the curtain over there. Uh, and so many materials have crystalline order. So this is a clean lattice, pictures all from Wikipedia, by the way, clean lattice of oxygen and silicon, uh, what could become window glass, but here it's a nice uh, crystal, uh, like many materials, nice crystalline order. But to get glass, like window glass or glasses, hopefully they're plastic, but uh, if they're made of glass, then it's the same two atoms, oxygen and silicon, but in this kind of network instead, this kind of pretty disordered array. No crystalline order, right? So this is a mess. Uh, it's randomly disordered. Um, and one important thing to note about this is that you can see sometimes you have like this, you know, here you always have these hexagons. Here you sometimes have this shape, sometimes this one. There's lots of configurations that have basically the same energy. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, the kind of frustration in classical system that comes about when you have randomness. Okay, and that's in classical system. So what I'll talk about now with this new theory is this kind of frustration in disorder, which is well understood in classical systems, that's just window glass or your glasses or things like that, but now in quantum systems of electron spins. And I'll show that the right way to describe it now with quantum entanglement uh, uh, relies uh, in, in particular ways on quantum entanglement when you have quantum mechanics, and that's work with Central. And then with more work with Central and follow-up work with uh, Patrick Lee here, uh, I'll talk about the predictions to experiment, uh, and indeed how they, I think, uh, and I'll argue, and you can uh, decide to believe what you believe, uh, I think they actually really explain uh, some big puzzles that have existed in experimental data. Uh, some of the puzzles have been there for almost a decade, actually. Okay, so that's the theory. So now that I've built it up, let me, let me kind of go back from the ground up, remind you of a few things from uh, two years ago, uh, uh, and give an introduction to the spins and entanglement, uh, which will be easy to understand. So these are uh, electron spins, and they're pointing somewhere. That's the North Pole pointing up here, pointing down here. And often what you have is that the electron spins minimize energy by alternating up, down, up, down. Okay, that's what they like doing. So that's what happens here, you know, real materials maybe uh, have some uh, 2D or 3D structure, but you can alternate, like a chessboard, up, down, up, down. The neighbors are always alternating. But sometimes you have lattices that have triangles, for example. So maybe this one chooses to be up and this electron chooses to be down, sitting over here, but then the electron sitting on this atom over here doesn't know what to do. Up or down, doesn't really matter. Right? So this kind of competing classical states or the, this kind of frustration means that quantum mechanics gets to kick in and have enormous effects now in quantum mechanics. 
Uh, I mean, I'll remind you if uh, you're familiar with uh, these kind of chemistry diagrams. In benzene, for example, we have these two kinds of classical states. Double bonds can be here or here. Uh, and these two states actually quantum resonate. And chemists draw this picture to say that the right state of the <coughs> molecule is actually the entangled state of these two, the superposition. And that's what happens here, too. Um, and so the way to think about this, uh, when you have two spins, we're familiar with that. That's what's called the two-spin singlet state or the two-spin valence bond. And that's really the kind of valence bond you have as part of bonding in many materials. And uh, so in this cartoon picture, that's what I'll draw as the cartoon picture. Uh, you have the spin pointing up and the other spin pointing down, and this uh, blue ellipse denotes that they're entangled. Okay, okay now, is the left one up or is the right one up? Uh, yeah, doesn't matter. That's the point of entanglement. Actually, these two states are entangled with each other. So they're always opposite to each other, but which one is up, which one is down is indeterminate. So that's all you need to know about entanglement. And uh, that's quantum entanglement, that's the essence, and that's what gives you spooky action at a distance if it's a long-range bond, long-range valence bond. So now that we know everything there is to know about entanglement, uh, I'll go from two particles to many. Yes? So was there? <laughs> Good. My understanding of entanglement had only been polarized for photons. Yeah. Are you saying you can do electron spin entanglement now? Exactly. Is that uh, a recent phenomenon? Okay, so I'm describing this theoretically. This does happen. This is the chemical bond that happens in materials. So in some sense, nature already does this for electrons all the time. And you can think of these, if you'd like, as like a polarization. You know, polarization is horizontal or vertical for photons, but here, up or down, replace horizontal versus vertical. And it's mathematically the same thing. And this happens in nature all the time, usually on a short distance. In particular, one of the ways in which it happens in nature, less conventional, but this does happen, is this kind of pattern uh, that you can get. So uh, the points here are uh, electrons sitting on atoms that are arranged in this crystal. Uh, and sometimes they choose this kind of pattern of valence bond. This one chooses this neighbor to pair with, et cetera. That's some pattern that you get. Okay, so this is one pattern but you get. a big jump for long range entanglement. Yeah, exactly. How would you get long range from this? Exactly. Well, let me try to show you. Good. That's exactly the right question. And that's, I mean, and people have been trying to study this for a long time. So, yeah, what I'll talk about is some new ideas for how to do this. So the, the, the obvious thing to note, so we want to ask, we want to actually add the complication to then get answers to even older questions. So the complication is disorder, complication or a feature, bug or a feature, you know, as, as you wish. Uh, but it's always there in materials, so at least that's one motivation for me to study it. And one thing that happens with the disorder uh, is that, for example, maybe there's some impurity here that makes these two spins interact more strongly with each other, but there's something else here that makes these two spins interact more strongly with each other. Uh, if these two interact more strongly, they'll be more likely to pair, to choose each other, to pair into this valence bond. And so it makes sense that with this order, instead of getting one pattern across the sample, you get this one pattern over here in this region, and then this other pattern over there in this other region, selected by the particular randomness that exists in the material. Um, uh, and the patterns are created, of course, by minimizing energy based on the existing randomness. Okay, so that was it for what people expected would happen. But there's another piece to the story that we found. And the key insight is that there are special points that can arise between patterns. So in 1D, it's kind of obvious. Let me start with 1D. So let's say this is one pattern in 1D. I drew the spins as up and down, but of course, you know, these two are entangled. So is this one down or up? Doesn't matter, it's entangled with its neighbor. That's one pattern. Disorder randomness creates different patterns. Pattern A here, pattern B here. And between the two patterns, between pattern A and pattern B, is this single unpaired spin. That's all alone. It doesn't have anyone to pair with. And it has to be there between patterns A and B. It's always there. It's a topological defect, where topological has many meanings. And here it means you cannot get rid of it. It has to be there. It's always that one, one thing there. 
And what's really interesting is that now that you have these topological defects, that's a way to naturally make them give long range entanglement. Because even if they're far away separated from each other, often energetically they'll have to choose some other spin to pair with and entangle with, even if that other spin might be very far away. So these are the pictures in 1D. And uh, in 2D, actually we found that there are similar pictures and some of that is based on some uh, similar mathematical work though with a completely different setting or conclusion uh, that Sentel did uh, a decade ago. Um, uh, and so you have these vortex patterns. This is the kind of vortex in these patterns. You can kind of see there is a circulation going around the central point, right? So that's why I call it a vortex. It's a kind of circulation. And in that central point, we can show mathematically there has to be this unpaired spin. And we show it mathematically because actually these vortices, vortices are vortices in something, not just in the pattern, but in some emergent gauge field, like the gauge fields that uh, Gen B talked about earlier. Uh, and in these vortices of these emergent gauge fields, there has to be that unpaired spin, which then has to find a distant neighbor, often energetically has to, to pair with and give you long range entanglement. So that's one interesting thing. Now there's other things that we needed to check with this uh, theory. So I can even show other pictures for uh, other parts of the theory that we checked. For example, you might worry that when you have more dirt, when you don't have any patterns, you just have these isolated bonds, uh, maybe you get this kind of mess without any free spins. Uh, but we could show that that's not true. You always have free spins that appear. Uh, so the right configuration looks like this. You always have these extra isolated unpaired spins. Uh, and for this, I don't have any simple arguments. We needed to do some uh, algorithm actually to use some check to find some algorithm uh, to compute this directly and find that energetically these always appear. These topological defects always appear. But we could do this, so that's the pattern. Uh, and so the picture we have, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the idea of OG flow, you zoom in and you might see this kind of pattern. And as you zoom out then, you see that at low energies, you just have these long range entangled uh, bonds and some other free spins. And that's what gives you the emergent low energy physics. Very different from the microscopic physics. The emergent physics here is really completely different, even though I can draw some pictures to motivate it. So now that we have this framework and this picture, well, we can ask, uh, uh, what do you expect to see in experiments in connection to this? Uh, and an obvious thing that you get, you know, that's really robust, you don't, not really model dependent, but a robust statement out of the, just the pictures I drew is uh, something called power law scaling, power laws in many different quantities, power laws in all the densities of states, and also data collapse, which I'll explain in the next few slides. Uh, uh, and that's pretty robust predictions out of these pictures of this uh, emergent spins with long range entanglement. So do we see this in experiments? Uh, okay, so to do that, let me go straight to experiments. Uh, so here I'm showing experimental data from uh, this group in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, uh, that was actually just published in Nature. The experimental data here is heat capacity. So it's really simple, straightforward experiment. You uh, add energy and you see how the temperature changes as you heat up your sample. How, how much heat does it, how much energy does it take uh, to change the temperature? Uh, and that's the blue curve here as a function of temperature, the heat capacity, and the other curves are what happens when you add a magnetic field. And you can see that the heat capacity decreases when you add larger magnetic fields. Already from here, there is a nice sign that our theory might be the correct one because there's something weird already at zero field here. This is a power law, this is a log-log plot so you can see it's over like many, two orders of magnitude of temperature, uh, lots of different temperature. You see this straight line in the log-log plot, meaning it's a power law. And it's a power law with a fractional exponent, square root, which is really weird, very difficult to explain in traditional theories. But that's exactly what you expect from the pictures I just showed you. So you have that square root. Okay, and this looks like a mess. So maybe, at first we thought maybe we should be satisfied with the agreement of this square root to, our, to the predictions of our theory and forget about this mess. Uh, but then we looked more closely um, and actually it turns out this mess, all of these different functions, if you take each one of them and multiply it by the square root of the magnetic field value, 
not the temperature square root like the blue curve, but the square root of the magnetic field value, and you plot them now multiplied by this factor on a log-log plot or on whatever plot you want, you plot them together on the same plot, they all collapse to the same curve. Here they don't collapse because there's some other effect like phonons giving you other heat capacity. But the part of the heat capacity coming from the spins, which is in this region, all of them collapse onto exactly the same curve. So this kind of data collapse is pretty amazing. That's how we understand uh, critical points. Um, uh, it's, it's a rare thing to see. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, pretty nice data collapse over two orders of magnitude uh, in temperature. And what that means is that here, right, there's data of heat capacity C in two variables, magnetic field and temperature. But all this data can be described in terms of just one function. All this infinitely many functions actually collapse to be described by just a single function, which looks like this. So that's pretty amazing. And they indeed thought this was amazing in this experimental collaboration. And actually already in some totally unrelated material, the previous one was an iridate, this is a molybdenate, data from over half a decade ago from Johns Hopkins. Similar experiment, heat capacity at zero field. As you increase a field, you see it decreasing. Again, lots of different functions, but when you do a similar collapse, multiplying them by h to the 0.56, they all collapse to the same curve once again. And amazingly to pretty similar curves. Okay, so now the punchline is I'll show the calculation we did uh, from the theory, uh, what should the curves be? Uh, we get two or three different curves depending on very general aspects of the materials. Uh, basically, for example, uh, whether it's two-dimensional material or three-dimensional material. Uh, and for these materials, we expect this curve. Here we call it Q equals one. Uh, and so not only do you get the power law at zero field and you get the data collapse to a single curve, that single curve, uh, I think, seems to agree pretty well with what we expect uh, from the theory. And uh, that was really surprising to us and amazing because there's so much mess going on in any case in these complicated materials where all the electrons interact together with quantum mechanics. And now we're adding more mess. All these materials have randomness. That's the definition of a mess. But from that mess, the theory suggests there should be some detail-independent universality, and that's indeed found, I think, pretty nicely in the materials. And now there's already three other materials where uh, both of these curves are found. Um, yeah, so that's the punchline of what I wanted to say. Um, and um, good, and that's the right time. And uh, uh, of course, as part of uh, developing this new approach, uh, we answer some questions and we open as many questions as we answer. So I think some of the new questions that this new approach raises, there's new questions in all the different fields we bridge. Quantum information uh, and theorems about ground state entanglement, like Lee schultz mattis theorems for the experts. Questions in classical statistical physics about randomness and defect nucleation. Uh, and of course, in understanding experiments uh, in 2D and 3D materials, and maybe not just in magnets, but other systems. Uh, so I'll thank uh, my collaborators, everyone at MIT, because I really appreciated the community here, um, especially Sentel, with uh, whom I, uh, a lot of my work was done here, and also I worked a lot with uh, Liang Fu and Patrick Lee, and, and talked to everyone, so I'm really thanking everyone. Uh, and finally, especially, uh, thank you, uh, Neil and Jane. Thanks. I don't have a particular question at all, to be honest with you. How about your friend? I've known him for at least three years now, his field is always confusing to me. <laughs> That's all I can say. I drew so many pictures. <laughs> I agree, but what I don't understand is where are you going with this theory? What, I, I could understand your point that those defects are long range, perhaps, entanglement. Yeah. But, Entanglement itself is a, obviously, I don't see any simple practical application of entanglement. And this is simply pointing out that the defects are very similar in concept to entanglement. <laughs> that right. I understand. Right. So in terms of practical applications, 
indeed, my motivation is not practical applications. My motivation is to try to understand, understand the right. collective quantum mechanics of many particles uh, and to understand experiments. But there is a connection, there are connections. So of course, first, because we see this really happening in experiment, that's an immediate practical application of to understand, I think, many different materials, what people often kind of threw away parts of their data or just said, oh, we have this data, but we don't understand it. It's been sitting there for decades. Now we have a way of understanding it, which means that you can control, understand that part of your data, and now have a better understanding of what else is going on. So I think that's actually a really important aspect uh, for understanding experimental data in general. And as a more general statement about, you know, uh, I, me and I think also my fellow researchers in condensed matter theory, we're not often directly motivated by practical applications, but we all do have in the back of our mind the transistor, which was invented through quantum mechanical theories that didn't seem to have any practical applications, right? Like in early quantum mechanics, I think Dirac had some statement accepting the Nobel Prize that there's no uh, uh, applications that could possibly arise from quantum mechanics. Okay. And then people invented the transistors. The that, world uh, changed, right. Exactly. So I cannot, I cannot uh, say any particular application. You know, I can say some words like building a quantum computer that could connect to this. But honestly, I think the most important applications would be ones that we have no way of imagining right now. Thank you. Um, maybe building on an earlier question or Neil's. Yeah. We've demonstrated, or many experiments done photon and uh, entanglement kilometers away yeah. from each other. You're not talking about that kind of distance here. Is are there any, any, anything else has been shown to be entangled? at that kind of distance besides photons? What I'm talking photons? about now is very different, right? Because yeah. I know I, I talked about the photons at the beginning because that's what we're familiar right. with. Right. Um, but instead of just taking two controlled objects and just the two of them, and then you can manipulate them and control them, and I think people have done that, as far as I know, only with photons across large distances. Right, right, right. Um, but here, the electrons are sitting 10 to the 23 of them right. in this piece of material. So it's a very different type of entanglement, actually. I, I understand, and it's long distance on atomic scales, but it's not. Exactly. And it's collective. Right. That's the important aspect here. It's collective among the billions and billions, 10 to the 23. Right. Right. Questions from the audience? Jesse. The emergent, the mess you have microscopically is not at all self-similar. Exactly, exactly. So that's that's the very surprising thing. Actually, the way to get the power law is to have as little mess as possible at microscopic scales. That gives you the much larger mess after the RG flow, uh, and that's because of these topological defects that get nucleated. And the reason they get nucleated, I think, is a much deeper reason connected to these theorems on uh, quantum entanglement on ground states, like Liebschultz matters. Um, and once you get these defects nucleating, uh, then you no longer have the lattice. Then in some sense, you're able to forget the microscopic details and get the emergent self-similarity. I think we have time for one more question. Michael? Yeah. Do you have to pick a particular geometry, like this triangular lattice, to do that calculation, or is there a more material modeling kind of way that you can do that? The results, so I look at 2D in this case. The results turn out to depend on whether the 2D lattice is a bipartite or not, which really means whether the shapes enclosed have an even or an odd number of uh, uh, sides. So we needed to do it separately for the square lattice and the triangular lattice. But once we did these two, that covers all possible cases in two dimensions. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank Neil and Howard and Colleen and Kurt Marble for being here and supporting our department. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for five terrific talks. And I'd like to thank uh, the audience for their, their attention and um, have a good day. We'll see you later tonight. Thank you. Thank you.